let's talk a little bit uh, about what's happening in the U.S. when it comes to the election and what we're seeing in terms of messaging from the Democratic Party, because there's a disconnect. I'm sure most people in the audience have noticed this disconnect, um, but it's becoming increasingly frustrating because uh, this messaging is obviously in mainstream media and it just completely ignores the fact that Democrats, the establishment, centrists, moderates, they have created a situation in which it doesn't matter to them whether Trump wins or Biden wins, because at the end of the day, they're going to win. Their stock portfolios are going to win. And I think their actions um, really, really highlight that. So, um, so moderate Democrats have been aggressively bullying Bernie Sanders supporters to not only support Joe Biden by voting for him, but to endorse Joe Biden. And I think those are two different things. Endorsing Joe Biden is making the case for why you think he's the best candidate, why you think he should represent this country, why you think he should represent you. Voting for him because he's the lesser of two evils is something different, right? So uh, Brianna Joy Gray, the former national press secretary for the Bernie Sanders campaign, made it clear that she will not endorse Bernie Sanders. DSA did the same. And there was uh, a full news cycle dedicated to shaming them and bullying them for their political views. But what I would ask is that the Democratic Party take a good hard look at itself and have a moment of self-reflection if, and I don't believe this to be true, if they claim that beating Donald Trump is the top priority. The reason why I don't think that's actually true is because the actions of the Democratic Party in the middle of this pandemic where people are suffering financially shows just how little they care about working Americans, how little they care about beating Donald Trump, and how little they're paying attention to the fact that Donald Trump in some regard is beating Democrats with a more leftist message. That might sound crazy, but let me make my case. So this week we learned that 22 million people filed for unemployment because of this pandemic. People have been laid off, uh, they've been fired indefinitely. Um, and so the question is, what are they gonna do now that they've lost the money that they've been making, their income? But on top of that, we have this broken system where health insurance is tied to your employer. So 22 million people not only lose their job, they probably also lost their health insurance in the middle of a pandemic where this virus is highly contagious and lethal for many people who have underlying health conditions. Donald Trump has decided to tackle this issue not by some bureaucratic method where he goes through Congress. He's actually decided to pump money into hospitals so the uninsured can have coverage for their coronavirus uh, treatments. Uh, through the money, the tens of billions of dollars he has just pumped into these hospitals. But Democrats have a completely different solution. They've proposed two things. Number one, they have proposed to reopen enrollment for Obamacare, which you would have to pay for, um, and people have been laid off, so how exactly would people pay for that? The, uh, the second proposal is actually far worse. Um, and so Sludge wrote about it in, in great detail, and I wanna give you these details right now. So Democratic leadership in Congress are planning to include a measure in the next coronavirus package to expand subsidies for COBRA health insurance program, allowing people who lose their jobs to keep the same insurance plan that their employer had made available to them. Now here's the catch. Under the plan, the federal government would pay the full cost of premiums to private health insurance companies to keep laid off people on their plans. But the COBRA expansion would not provide coverage to people who become unemployed, but were not receiving coverage through their employers. It would also not cover people's deductibles. And we know how insanely expensive deductibles are. And so to come in and say, all right, um, we're not going to cover certain people with this proposal, and then on top of that, we're not going to cover premiums is out of control. <laughs> I mean, because again, 22 million people just lost their jobs. They have no income. And working Americans were already in a precarious situation prior to the pandemic 
where nearly half of Americans couldn't even afford a $400 emergency. So what kind of solution is this? It's absolutely ridiculous. On the other hand, um, you have someone like Donald Trump, again, pumping money into these hospitals in order to provide coverage for people who can't afford coronavirus treatment. So I'm going to skip ahead to what Trump is doing. Um, and this was actually reported in Jacobin. I think this is an incredibly important piece uh, that highlights how little Democrats really want to beat Donald Trump. Rather than lean on Obamacare to cover patients, the Trump administration opted to directly cover the cost of COVID-19 treatment for the uninsured. And um, again, that's a simple, unbureaucratic way of ensuring that people get the care that they need. Now, I want to be clear about one thing. Donald Trump is not some leftist. We all know this. Donald Trump cares about Donald Trump and only Donald Trump. He is thinking about his reelection, plain and simple. And he knows, you know, based on what happened in 2016, that positioning himself as someone who is more to the left compared to the Democratic candidate plays well because people have been suffering economically for decades and it's getting worse. And the pandemic has only, you know, again, amplified that for a lot of people. And so what does the messaging from the Democratic Party say, not only when it comes to the policies they're proposing, but more importantly, um, by the stuff that everyone sees, everyone consumes on social media? Well, let me give you an example. Here's Nancy Pelosi showing off her gourmet ice cream collection um, in the middle of a pandemic where 22 million people have been laid off. Let's watch. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, what have you found? What are you going to share with us from your home? Chocolate. Really? Chocolate. chocolate, chocolate, candy. Oh, wow. And this is, this is something you can get through the mail. Okay. You never run out. Can I show, show you? Me. Yeah, absolutely. This is the episode of Cribs I never knew I needed. Oh, my. Wow. Other people in our family go for some other flavors, but chocolate and then we have some other chocolate here. <laughs> so I, I want to be clear about, you know, I, I'm not showing that video to, you know, say that people can never have fun, that they can't have light segments or light interviews in the middle of a serious pandemic. Um, I think that if you are a lawmaker, if you're part of democratic leadership, um, you have an obligation to ensure that people are being taken care of. Um, instead of, you know, indulging in these types of like PR stunts where you're trying to become more relatable by showing off how much you love chocolate. I don't, I don't care how much Nancy Pelosi likes chocolate. That doesn't improve the lives of Americans who are suffering right now. And then look, Michael, I want to bring you in now the sweater. Like I know maybe I'm the only one who's like hyper obsessed with what she's wearing there, but like the yachting sweater as she's showing off like her beautiful basket of gourmet chocolate and then her giant sub-zero fridge, which costs each one of those, by the way, costs $12,000. She has two of them. Um, you know, she <laughs> opens that to show off her ice cream collection. Again, I don't care if people have those luxuries necessarily, but I do care when these are the same people who are just completely bullying the Brianna Joy Grays of the world for not endorsing Joe Biden because they think that Brianna Joy Gray has all this power to prevent Biden from getting elected. No, Nancy Pelosi and people like her are what leads to the Democratic Party losing. They led to Donald Trump winning. And I actually think they're okay with that because fundamentally Donald Trump does not really challenge their power. Donald Trump doesn't um, you know, create a situation in which they're worried about their stock portfolios. And Donald no. Trump does provide an opportunity for Nancy Pelosi to position herself as the resistance, but it's all optics. Ripping up a speech is not real resistance. Sarcastically clapping at Trump is not real resistance. If we lose, if Democrats lose to Trump, it is not Bernie Sanders supporters' fault. It is the Democratic establishment's fault. And I think that they're actually fine with that. Yeah, I, I well, first of all, uh, just the other day, I recorded an episode of Potted Out with our mutual really good friend Nando Vila, where he's rewatching along with his great co-host Entourage. Uh, and we talked about an episode of Entourage and 
it brought me back to this whole cultural terrain of like 2003, 2004. And Nancy Pelosi definitely looks like she's auditioning for an extra role in Wedding Crashers of like the sinister grandma who Vince Vaughn has like a weird crush on. Um, and she's into it. So, yes, I definitely noticed that sweater. I think that's totally valid. Um, yeah, I mean, I, this is another thing that we've talked about. I think it's really important. It, Bill Barr at the DOJ has put in a recommendation. I don't know the state of it, but we've covered it to allow for indefinite pre-trial detention in the times of emergency. It's an incredible threat. We know the whole apparatus of ICE and uh, terrorism uh, towards migrants and refugees and asylum seekers put in place under Stephen Miller in this administration. By the way, these are all the concrete and tangible reasons to understand that obviously Trump needs to go. It's not really that complicated. But on the other hand, this very big melodramatic discussion of Nazism and totalitarianism has really allowed people that are under no threat uh, and will have you know plenty of time to pontificate on cable news and be in Congress to basically wrap themselves in melodrama and not do anything. And another thing I want to note, not because I care about the hypocrisy, but just because we need to be real about power positions. You know, Brianna Joy Gray can be hounded or various, you know, Twitter personalities or whatever, which, you know, again, let's be frank, we don't have that much power. There's some power, there's some influence, but, you know, that can, this can be a major object of focus of, of sort of harassing people about not only supporting Biden over Trump, which, you know, is my practical position, I won't hide the ball on that. But like to do it enthusiastically or pretend that Biden is something other than what he is or pretend that the Democratic Party is something other than what it is. Whereas, you know, uh, Joe Manchin, when he said during the primary that if Bernie was the nominee, he absolutely would not support the nominee. I don't even think he even committed to supporting another Democratic nominee. That's reported as, you know, an important message from the moderate ring of the Democratic Party, even though, of course, we just know that. You know, Joe Manson and Kristen Sinema are just extreme corporatists who like to play to the far right, uh, you know, even more so than kind of average corporatists like Schumer or whatever. So, you know, I say that again to just really point. I mean, it's worth noting the double standards, but it also should reinforce where we're at in terms of suction and leverage. And I would say for, you know, people like uh, Mehdi Hassan, like. Hectoring and moralizing is not going to get the job done. If you want to actually persuade people, um, do it in a way that is, as I would say, frankly, a lot more, you know, real and humble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I, I think that there's just far too much attention. I think you're right. Um, the Bernie wing of the Democratic Party does not have the power to get Trump reelected, right? And I think that the bullying and the hyper focus on these voters and, and pressuring them to vote for Biden, but for some people, I think that it's genuine. I, I think for Mehdi Hassan, it's genuine. But I think for the Democratic establishment, it, it's about distracting and, and messaging in a way where people are just like focused on the least powerful people when it comes to the outcome of this election, right? So behind the scenes, they can do what they've always been doing. So I'm going to go down the, the laundry list of uh, issues that you mentioned. I mean, ICE, for instance. Do yep. you think that Nancy Pelosi is a resistor when it comes to the actions that we're seeing at the border right now? Are you kidding me? She fought progressives within her own party, within the House, more aggressively than she fought the Trump administration. She handed Trump a $4.6 billion blank check for border security. And when Representative Ocasio-Cortez spoke out against it, Pelosi went and had that New York Times interview with Maureen Dowd, you know, to trash progressives because they had the audacity to speak out against that blank check. Uh, one other thing that's been happening uh, through this pandemic that hasn't gotten much media attention, Democrats haven't done anything about it, the EPA announced that there will be no oversight of corporations during the pandemic. They can pollute, uh, 
you know, our, our air, our water, whatever they want. And they don't have to worry about any of the rules or any of the regulations. A story broke yesterday about how uh, there will be no oversight when it comes to the amount of mercury <laughs> that that makes it into uh, our environment. It's just disgusting. Yep. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, William Barr wants to detain people indefinitely. Where's the resistance when it comes to that very real criminal justice issue. It's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. And you know, the more I look at the actions of the Pelosi's of the world, the more angry I get when they just hone in on progressives and they fight the progressives while all of our civil liberties, civil rights, uh, you know, all of that is being dismantled by the Republican Party right now? What kind of real resistance have we seen from them? And what kind of real proposals have we seen from the Nancy Pelosi's of the world to help people who are really struggling? Instead, we get that video, which, by the way, gets used by Donald Trump, because of course it does. Donald Trump understands optics. He understands marketing. So let's go. Yeah, perfect. So Charlie Kirk had tweeted, Nancy Pelosi sits in her $7.5 million San Francisco home in front of her $24,000 fridges, bragging about her stockpile of $13 a pint gourmet ice cream, all while 22 million Americans file for unemployment and funding for small businesses runs dry. Shameful. Now, again, caveat. Of course, the Republicans don't care about that. Of course, Charlie Kirk doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about the 22 million people who just filed for unemployment. Um, they, I mean, they'll fight more aggressively than anyone to maintain the system we're living under. But then Donald Trump quote tweets that because of course he does. And this is the kind of stuff that gets the Donald Trumps of the world elected because he positions himself as someone who's morally superior when it comes to looking out for the working class. Period. You're 100 percent right. And then, of course, and then the demand on us becomes, why are you not defending Nancy Pelosi? It's not my job. Not it's my not job to defend job. Nancy Pelosi. Yep. It's not our job. I like those. So I liked I think uh, Brendan from the majority report pointed out that the, the Nancy Pelosi meme that has not happened yet is her washing her hands to get rid of Corona, but like doing one of her fucking claps. That'll be like the definitive democratic resistance answer to Corona. You have a lot of people in the Democratic Party who are purely in politics for symbolism and they don't care about the consequences of anything else. And that is never going to be reconcilable with a materialist project. Absolutely. It's the optics of resistance. It's not true resistance. Um, but I do also want to note that there are uh, some Democratic lawmakers who are proposing excellent legislation. Of course, you have the Bernie Sanders of the world, but, um, you know, Ro Khanna, Rashida Tlaib, uh, they are fighting for a $2,000 a month universal basic income for six months. Um, and then people would also get some financial assistance for up to a year after the pandemic. And that's to ensure that people really do get back on their feet and are able to provide for themselves, for their families, uh, to get their small businesses in order. Uh, there was a report about how 20 percent of small businesses are expected to shutter permanently as a result of this pandemic. The three hundred fifty billion dollars that Congress had set aside to help small businesses has already run out. And it's just it's shameful to see where the priorities are, where they've been. I mean, we've known this, uh, but the examples are just like really starting to pile up. And I just think it's laughable and shameful to put all of our focus and, and energy on shaming people who refuse to endorse a subpar candidate who has done terrible things legislatively in his political career. The major reason we're here. I agree with you completely, Anna.